Christian scientist and associate professor of medicine at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. A member of both the UNC Weinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center and UNC Breast Center. Co-director of the Multidisciplinary Brain Metastasy Clinic at UNC and the leader of the UNC Breast Cancer Clinical Trials Program. Dr. Anders' research focuses on the biology of triple negative breast cancer and brain metastases. She serves as the principal investigator for multiple clinical trials, evaluating novel anti-cancer agents to more effectively treat patients excuse me, <coughs> with, that, with advanced triple negative breast cancer and brain metastases. In parallel and support by the UNC Chapel Hill Hematology and Oncology, K-12 NIH NCI K-23. <laughs> Well, I do spend a lot of my time um, thinking about triple negative breast cancer, but in my clinic, and um, as I think about breast cancer as a whole, we um, have triple negative patients, we have patients with HER2 positive disease, and we have patients with hormone receptor positive disease. And today I'm going to spend the next half hour or so talking more about HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, my colleague Lisa Carey, um, who is also our department chair, is in one of the neighboring um, sessions talking about triple negative disease. So I appreciate everyone being here and hopefully over the next half hour we'll learn a few things um, and then I'm very interested in actually hearing your feedback through the questions and answers, which I hope to be very interactive. So let's start. All right. So what are we going to talk about? Um, one of the first things I wanted to talk about is this issue of receptor discordance. And this is really um, an issue of receptors changing throughout the course of the metastatic progression. And I was um, very interested in what Dr. Holbert had to say earlier about studying metastasis themselves as opposed to applying everything that we're learning about breast cancer back to the primary tumor. So we'll talk about that um, at the beginning of the talk. Um, um, actually, second, of course, at the beginning, we're going to talk about HER2 positive breast cancer in and of itself and how we really have seen a huge change in the landscape of how we manage HER2 positive breast cancer, particularly since I completed my training about six years ago. There's been just a dramatic shift in the new drugs that we are, are giving in clinic and in clinical trials. And then we'll talk about an overview of the actual um, therapies that you may, many of you may be receiving or have heard of or have read about. Um, so hopefully we'll have a very interactive conversation after that. So a little history lesson. So HER2 positive um, breast cancer or the HER2 gene or oncogene was first identified about 30 years ago. Um, and this is again sort of reiterating the concept of laboratory medicine uh, transitioning to the clinic. Um, and I think this has really been um, one of the groundbreaking discoveries in the laboratory that, is, that has actually changed our clinical management and improved survival for patients with HER2 positive breast cancer. Here is a little timeline of what's happened since that first discovery 30 years ago. So in early 2000, um, it's very difficult to read this here, you can see this was one of the first, um, the first publications that described trastuzumab. And I'll tend to use, throughout the course of the, of the um, presentation, I'll probably talk more about the generic names of the medications. So many of us know this drug to be Herceptin. Um, but I think um, just in, in being um, uh, true to the generic name of the drugs, we'll use Trastuzumab. So this was in 2000. Um, and during the time of my fellowship, we were looking at Trastuzumab in clinical trials. And then the, the next kit on the block was um, Lapatinib which is another way to target HER2 positive breast cancer. And we'll go through the actual mechanisms of these drugs and, and how they affect the breast cancer cells throughout the course of the presentation. 
So this brings us up to kind of mid-2000s. Well, then in 2010, 2009, um, the scientists in the laboratory started to combine lapatinib with trastuzumab, and this led to a clinical trial evaluating um, non-chemotherapies, only HER2-directed therapies, the two together, lapatinib and trastuzumab, um, which was presented and published and also shows survival advantages. And then we move up to 2012, which was a really big year. So we have two presentations in 2012. Um, the first um, evaluating a new compound called pertuzumab. The other name for this, which you may have heard of, is Pergetta. Not sure where they came up with that name. Sounds like a car to me. But in any case, uh, pertuzumab, which is a really unique um, HER2-directed agent, and we'll go through its mechanism as well. And then flash forward to a little later in the year, um, to TDM1, or trastuzumab emtansine, and the other drug name for this is Cadsila. Um, so that is sort of a, a brief history lesson going back all the way to 30 years when we first discovered HER2, or the scientists discovered HER2, to just very recently with the advent of all of these targeted, explosion of targeted therapies in the HER2-positive metastatic landscape. So moving forward just a little bit with receptor discordance, and I, um, one of the first things I did was just to see, well, what is the actual definition of discordance? So according to Webster's, discordance is the state of not agreeing, being out of harmony, or being in variance. And I think this can happen throughout the metastatic progression. I mean, I think it's something we really need to pay attention to in terms of um, uh, making our treatment decisions. So which receptors are we currently talking about? We're talking about the estrogen receptor, or ER, the progesterone receptor, or PR, or again, HER2, which is, of course, the topic today. Other terms you may have heard have been receptor shift or tumor heterogeneity, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So what is the incidence of receptor discordance? Well, in the literature, discordance rates between what is found at the primary diagnosis in the primary tumor and metastasis later in the disease course has been on the order of about 15% for the estrogen receptor. And what we commonly see, the direction is, is that cancers will actually lose expression of the estrogen receptor. We don't know exactly why that's happening, but part of it could be due to the exposure to estrogen therapies over over the um, time course of the disease. Um, but we are seeing this, and it's important to know this because if expression of the estrogen receptor drops out, well then certainly we don't want to be treating with estrogen receptor positive um, agents. The progesterone receptor um, has a much higher discordance rate, around 40%. And we think this is also related to response to treatment. The estrogen receptor and the progesterone receptor are closely linked together, and actually expression of the progesterone receptor shows whether or not the estrogen receptor is functional. And in response particularly to tamoxifen, we see the progesterone receptor um, expression decrease. So another thing we just have to watch. And it also gives us some insight as to what is happening between the interplay between the estrogen receptor and the progesterone receptor. And then HER2 is around 15%. So I think, you know, one of the um, things that comes up in my practice and many of you may have even heard me talk about is sometimes if things are not going the way we would have anticipated, it's important to go back and actually re-biopsy to be certain we're not dealing with this anywhere from 15 to 40 percent shift in the receptor status so we can better, better um, tailor our therapies and design our therapy plans to treat the cancer today as opposed to five, ten years ago. So this is the concept of tumor heterogeneity, and this has been quite interesting to me. So this is the concept that in a patient's primary tumor, let's see if I can work this. So this is just an illustration of patients who might have multiple sites of primary tumors. And this is not just, this is not just a field that's specific to breast cancer, but to lots of different cancers, lung cancers, pancreatic, um, you name it. So, so the concept is, is that the primary tumor um, may have been very effectively treated um, in the adjuvant setting or in the, in the um, earlier phases. But within that primary tumor, they, there may be multiple different types or clones of the same cancer. So here you see subclone 1 as part of this patient's tumor. You see subclone 2 and subclone 3. Well, the initial therapies may have wiped out subclone 1 and 2, but subclone 3 may have been the one that was resistant to therapy and went on to recur 1 to 10 years later. 
So this is something that I think is gaining a lot of traction in the laboratories where scientists are really trying to understand from an initial tumor how many different clones are there and of those clones which ones are going to be the ones that come back to bother us in the future. So I find this to be very exciting and I think honestly will be the way that we will move forward because if we can understand up front how to, how to target this third clone, then potentially we could cure the cancer at the beginning. So moving forward, I, I just thought it would be important to pause and actually talk about one of my own patients in my practice and to show you how this, um, you know, all of these percentages and, and um, statistics actually play out in, in real world. So this is a very sweet 45-year-old patient um, that has been in my practice for several years now. I started treating her at about the 2011 time frame, um, but her history started back in 2007 when she was diagnosed with estrogen receptor positive and HER2 positive breast cancer um, at quite a young age. And she got, at the time, very standard um, anthracycline taxane-based chemotherapy with her septin. Um, she completed her full year. She was very compliant and started her tamoxifen. Um, and then in 2010, um, she had a recurrence in bone, particularly in her sternum um, and in her liver while on tamoxifen. And interestingly, a liver biopsy at that time came back ER positive, HER2 negative. And this was like HER2 zero, not even one plus. So the physician at the time very appropriately transitioned her to um, letrozole, which is an, um, an aromatase inhibitor. Um, and then during the course of 2010 to 2013, she transitioned through multiple cycles of endocrine therapies, um, Phaslidex, which degrades the estrogen receptor, um, aromasin, another aromatase inhibitor with an mTOR inhibitor that has recently been, been FDA approved in estrogen receptor positive advanced breast cancer. And then at this point, we started to um, run out of endocrine therapies and became worried. This is about the time that she transitioned into my practice. We transitioned over to chemotherapy. So moved forward with capecitabine, also known as Zalota, and then weekly Taxol. Um, but at this point, I started to get nervous because um, I didn't feel that the Taxol and the capecitabine, that we had had enough time on therapy before the cancer started to progress. So I worried that we may have may be dealing with her two positive recur or, um, sort of resurging in the cancer. And sure enough, we rebiopsy the liver in 2013. The estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor were very weak, indicating that she had received these prior endocrine lines. And then the HER2, the HER2 um, was again three plus. So it was very interesting. And we then at that point transitioned to first line HER2 positive breast cancer therapy, which we'll talk a little bit more about, with paclitaxel, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab. And then she did ultimately progress on this regimen and has been on TDM1 to current. So this is a very, you know, a very real world case over the course of seven years where the cancer, actually different clones of the cancer um, changed and, and possibly in response to therapy, possibly due to the biology of the tumor. You know, I've always wondered, did we possibly biopsy a HER2 negative clone? And there was still HER2 positive breast cancer in the midst of the liver metastasis. And one could argue in this case, and I think it's um, controversial, but certainly has been done, even in the setting of a HER2 negative biopsy with a patient uh, with a history of HER2 positive breast cancer, that the HER2 directed therapy continues. So we might have a discussion about that a little later. Um, so moving on to the management of HER2 positive breast cancer. So what do we currently have in 2014, um, particularly in the FDA approved space? And I have to say, this has been the most rapidly changing space that I can remember um, in breast cancer. I don't have too much gray hair yet, but it's getting there. Um, but I have certainly um, just been so impressed with the, um, the toolkit that we now have, which, you know, when I was in my training, we had trastuzumab just in clinical trials. So again, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, TDM1, lapatinib, and then combinations of all of the above. So not to go through all of the details of this, um, of this schema, but this is a roadmap um, that I've seen presented at multiple meetings indicating how we should approach HER2 positive breast cancer. Because I have to say, with the explosion of all of the therapies, we're all grappling with, well, which one do we start first? When do we change? What about the patient's prior history? How should we take that into account as we're moving forward in the algorithm? So not to go through this in grave detail, but just to illustrate that um, you know, it's very different 
we approach this differently in patients who are hormone receptor positive and HER2 positive as compared to those that are estrogen receptor or hormone receptor negative versus uh, and HER2 positive. So that might be a consideration at the beginning. The other thing we think about is what is the proximity to prior therapy? When did the patient last have Herceptin? When did the patient last have um, uh, um, a taxane because that may determine which chemotherapeutic we want to partner because we don't want to give an agent that um, the tumor cells have just recently seen and have acquired resistance to. So this is, I'm, we're all still working on sort of in, ingraining this in our memory and I do go back to this on occasion when I'm making uh, clinical decisions. So um, as Marianne, quite, there you are, Marianne um, indicated I am what one would call a clinician scientist. So I am a physician by training, a physician by heart, and I love the science behind it. So it's been um, honestly the most fulfilling career to be able to take care of patients, but then also um, go back to the laboratory and try to understand what is driving the cancer cells. It actually gives me a lot of personal satisfaction because I can get quite frustrated with this cancer. So, um, so back to the science, because I, I, I love to talk about the science. So um, we'll go through this. This is um, your molecular biology um, uh, lesson for the day. Uh, this is a cell membrane. So this is a cancer cell membrane. This is the extracellular space, and this is the intracellular space. This probably feels like ninth grade biology. Um, but in any case, we have these receptors, and in this case, we're talking about HER2, that span both the extracellular and the intracellular space. What happens on the outside triggers what happens on the inside, and over time we end up in the double helix and DNA and RNA interact and we make proteins and that's how cancer cells grow. Um, but in any case, um, scientists much smarter than me um, decided that they would try to attack the HER2 receptor on the outside of the cancer cell membrane in multiple different ways. So we'll go through this. So, so HER2 itself is a pretty interesting receptor. It has lots of different arms, um, and trastuzumab binds to just one of those arms. And this is over here at, at sort of component four. Um, what trastuzumab does is it blocks the cancer cell signaling from the outside so that this downstream never occurs. Now, interestingly, cancer cells are smart, and sometimes these pathways are activated, and it really, they don't really care what's happening outside the cell. So that's something I think you may recognize a lot of these pathways, the PI3 kinase pathways now being targeted, mTOR, the ras raf mec pathway. So this is a topic for another day, but, but they certainly are interrelated. Um, the next um, therapy that we'll discuss is lapatinib. I'm kind of thinking about the timeline. So lapatinib, as many of you know, is an oral therapy. And what it does is it interacts both with HER1 and HER2. Uh, which does attribute to uh, some of the side effects of this medication, namely rash and diarrhea. Um, HER1 is also epithelial growth factor receptor, so we have that all over, over our skin and in our gut. Um, so lapatinib, um, as you can see, interacts inside the cell and blocks signaling at a different level. So you can imagine if you block here and you block here, you may get a more potent signal. So then moving on to pertuzumab. So Pertuzumab actually binds HER2's cousin, HER3. And actually the most potent signaling of HER2 is the communication between HER2 and HER3. HER2 actually needs partners to be able to signal as strongly as it needs to. So what pertuzumab does is it comes in and it blocks this friendship between HER2 and HER3. So you can imagine giving trastuzumab and pertuzumab, you're hitting HER2 at two different, two different levels. And then finally, TDM1 comes into play, and this is one that I have to say I have less experience giving in the clinic just because it's newer, um, but we are starting to learn the nuances of give, giving this drug. It's a very interesting drug we'll go through in a little more detail, but it actually binds, it's, it's trastuzumab, but bound to a chemotherapy. So it binds at the same place trastuzumab does, and I've actually had referring physicians ask me, well, if I give TDM1, do I also need to give trastuzumab? The answer is no, because we're, we're targeting. We, don't, we actually don't want to compete with the same receptor space. So just a, um, you know, a pretty complicated slide, but hopefully this gives a little more meaning to what all of these drugs are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right now, the biggest exposure is where we you've got a lot of targets. And yeah, yeah. So where, where are we missing the boat? I think it's down here. I think what happens is the cancer cells get smart, and whatever we do up here, they compensate down here. So that's why we're seeing a lot of new combination therapies with HER2-directed extracellular 
therapies with the intracellular. Exactly, exactly. So where were we in 2001? Um, so in 2001, we saw the first studies of adding trastuzumab to chemotherapy, and this was just the beginning of the story. And what we learned from this is that when you give trastuzumab to, with chemotherapy to patients with HER2-positive breast cancer that's metastatic, they live longer. So, and in oncology, that's our goal. You know, I think there's a, a lot of discussion about clinical trial endpoints, but our goal is to help patients live longer. So this was a, a huge advance, but certainly we can do better. So moving forward, so we, have, we had trastuzumab back in the early 2000s. Then we move forward to the pertuzumab studies, and this is the data that supports pertuzumab's FDA approval in the metastatic setting. And we're going to go and we're going to have sort of a lesson in Greek mythology. I have no idea why all of these trial names sound like Greek <laughs> goddesses, but it's, you know, it's, it's actually been quite interesting, all these new friends, Cleopatra, Amelia, you know, Marianne. And so in any case, um, Cleopatra was a randomized, so patients 50-50 chance, they were going to go on to receive trastuzumab with docetaxel, which is our, one of our standard um, taxane chemotherapies, or a placebo in this study, um, versus trastuzumab, docetaxel, and pertuzumab. Um, 808 women enrolled in this trial. And what did we learn from this trial? Well, we learned, and I, I remember sitting in the audience at San Antonio when this data was presented, and we just all kind of had a, draw, a jaw drop. So we learned that women who received pertuzumab with the, with the um, trastuzumab and the taxane fared better than those who received placebo. On average, they were free from disease progression for a, an additional six months. And importantly, survival was improved. So that was wonderful to see. You know, this was since trastuzumab the first time we had really seen this. Um, the toxicities, we can't forget the toxicities. And, and, and having a clinic with many patients with metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer, we've had to learn how to manage these drugs. And I have to say, um, the clinical trial doesn't always tell you exactly what to expect, right? So I would say the, um, the, the good news is, and, and I, we haven't talked about this yet, but trastuzumab does have a cardiac signal because one of the other cells in the body that expresses HER2 is the cardiac myocyte or the muscle cells. Um, and that's why we can see um, reduction in the um, ejection fraction or the ability of the, heart's, um, the heart to squeeze over time um, when, when trastuzumab is given. But in this case, when the um, pertuzumab and trastuzumab were combined together, we didn't see an additional cardiac toxicity over that of trastuzumab alone. So that was reassuring. Um, what we've seen in our practice is more diarrhea. Um, and I was actually talking to one of my colleagues last night who was telling me that they have had multiple patients need to be hospitalized due to this diarrhea. And this isn't like the 75-year-old patient. This is like the 40-year-old patient who has, you know, a robust immune system. And so, so it's been interesting, and we've really had to work around that. Um, and I would say I go ahead and prescribe Imodium and, and say keep it in your, in your cabinet, you know, more than three stools, and we need to go ahead and start the Imodium. So then we move forward to Amelia, um, and the analogy we use here for TDM1 is the Trojan horse approach. And this is really interesting, again, not to bore you with too much biology, but, or chemistry here. Um, trastuzumab, our, our friend, right, is linked through something called MCC to a drug called DM1 or mtansine. And this drug was actually given in clinical trials um, by itself years ago. I don't know how many years ago, but decades ago. Pardon? And it was way too toxic, given on its own. It did not pass the phase one trial test, but it's a really potent anti-cancer agent. So what the scientists did is they essentially hid the DM1 to the rest of the body so that the only cells that were seeing the, um, the toxicity were the HER2 positive cells. And luckily, we haven't seen a tremendous cardiac toxicity with this drug. You would worry that you might see um, worsening cardiac toxicity. So again, kind of a Trojan horse approach. The trastuzumab binds to the cancer cell and then releases the, the very toxic agent into the cancer cell. So what did we learn from Amelia? So this is the study schema. So TDM1 here. Um, Therapy is given just like trastuzumab every three weeks IV. Compared to, in this case, they elected, since pertuzumab was already sort of in the, the first line space, they um, studied this in the second line space. And what we had per standard of care at this, at this point was capecitabine and lapatinib, which um, 
we talked a little bit about as being an oral therapy against HER1 and HER2. So in this study, 980 women um, chose to enroll. So what did we learn here? Again, we learned that the women who received the TDM1 fared better than those that received the capecitabine and the lapatinib. An additional three months of progression-free survival, so not as, as robust as what we saw in the, um, the Cleopatra study. And again, this is average, so you know some women were, were on a, the shorter side of the progression and some were on the longer. Um, but again, importantly, the women who received TDM1 in the second line had improved survival. So again, another very exciting presentation to see. Toxicities are different. So with lapatinib and capecitabine, we do see the diarrhea and the rash that we talked about. Um, the TDM1 has surprised me in terms of blood counts. So I think what, what, what we really have to watch out for is a drop in platelets. And so we, we monitor that over time and adjust, um, adjust therapy appropriately. And then the additional... Um, uh, toxicity that we take, you know, take very seriously is elevated liver enzymes. And I recall a woman that I've taken care of, I've um, corresponded with her physician and she's come to see me several times from Asheville. And she came to me with elevated liver enzymes and my concern was, gosh, could I make this worse? The, the um, liver was irritated by the cancer, but we took the chance and we went ahead and administered and her, li and her liver enzymes actually improved to normal and she had a beautiful response on her PET, so, or PET CT. So, you know, we have to be very cautious about this, but sometimes we also have to weigh the risks and benefits of treating the cancer versus the side effects. And the other nice thing, um, you know, I, I think I talk to my patients about hair loss, and I think it's really important to talk about, and some of my patients make decisions about next line of therapy based on, on the alopecia rates. And the nice thing about the TDM1 and the capecitabine is you don't have to make that choice. Um, it doesn't cause alopecia or hair loss. There you go. Okay, we've got someone on the front row who can attest to that. <laughs> slow, slow to grow back in after chemotherapy now. And yeah. Yeah. It's slowing it. Yeah. Well, that's in, that's important to hear as well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And this is sort of like you can't just read the clinical trial to know. I mean, the real world experience and talking to your patients really helps you, you know, ex and know what to expect. Exactly. So, th so now I think the question is, which is better to give first, pertuzumab or TDM1? And, and no trial has really ever looked at that. Um, so there is, um, again, a new friend, Mary Ann, um, right? So there you go. Um, <laughs> right. And this is an ongoing phase three study that's looking at 1,000 women. Um, the first group will be randomized to kind of our, our tried and true over time, ataxine and, and trastuzumab. The second group will actually get TDM1 with pertuzumab, which will be really interesting to see. Very, really yeah. I get it now right. And then the other would just get TDM1. So I think this will really help us. Is this um, going on now? That is my understanding. I don't know if it's close to accrual, but we could certainly. Is it close to accrual now? What I wish they had done, and of course I wasn't asked when they designed this trial, but I think pertuzumab should be in this arm. But mm -hmm. that's just my, my two cents. But yeah, Monday morning quarterback. In the, first in the first arm, I think the fair comparison would be to trastuzumab, taxane, and pertuzumab. But. And that's what I try to get my college. Right. Kind of like to the back door. Well, and I think we don't have the safe. I think it's probably honestly based on safety. Um, well, based on cost. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. At, at what point can you know that from a, a metastatic stroke or something, what would TDM1 or MRI be looked at? In the, like in the um, early stage setting? So those studies are ongoing as well. Um, so pertuzumab is FDA approved in the neoadjuvant care of patients with HER2 positive locally advanced breast cancer. And I've certainly given that in the, um, in the neoadjuvant setting. Um, and the pathologic complete response rates are beautiful, like upwards of 60%. The question that I have and what we're grappling with in our clinics is that the NCCN guidelines say that for neo or adjuvant care, you can consider trastuzumab plus minus pertuzumab. 
And we actually don't have safety data for the full year of trastuzumab and pertuzumab unless we extrapolate from Cleopatra. And I will say, guilty as charged, I have done that. And some of my women who've done beautifully on taxane, platinum, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, neoadjuvantly, I've continued out the Herceptin and the, or the trastuzumab, pertuzumab for the full year. We're early on in that. And I've, that study's ongoing. It's called Affinity, the Affinity Study. Um, so I'll be very interested to see what that shows. But I think the promise in the Cleopatra study, um, particularly in our locally advanced breast cancer patients who may be stage three and very, we worry about transition to stage four, I think we've extrapolated some of that data, although, um, you know, we don't have level one evidence at this point to say we should do that. TDM1 is being studied um, in the adjuvant phase, exactly. And the, my memory of that study is they're comparing a taxane with her set, or trastuzumab, sorry, old habits die hard, um, versus TDM1 for the year. Um, and that study's being run out of Dana-Farber. We're um, planning to, we actually, I think we have that open at UNC already now, exactly. So that'll be interesting to see. No, no problem. So then, um, so then what about third line? You know, and I think, um, uh, my patients know I like a back pocket plan, right? So we talk about this a lot, like what would be our next step, what would be our next step after that? Um, and I think lapatinib is usually the agent we consider in the third line. And this study was quite interesting. I was actually at Duke when this study was being um, run by my mentor, Kim Blackwell, and enrolled several patients on this trial early on in the lapatinib days. And in this study, patients got only HER2-directed therapy. They did not receive a chemotherapy. So lapatinib, at time of progression, you could actually add trastuzumab back, back in, and many of my patients did that versus lapatinib and trastuzumab, and that was only in HER2-targeted therapy. And what was really interesting, even though women were, were allowed to add the trastuzumab back in at the time of progression, the women who started out with lapatinib and trastuzumab as a, a doublet had better survival. And so I have, um, I have been prescribing those two together. I would not give... You know, I don't, I don't know. I would never say never, but it's unusual for me to give lapatinib as a single agent based on this data. Exactly. Um, and again, you know, it's a nice alternative for a chemotherapy holiday. We all love chemotherapy holidays. Um, but again, diarrhea is, is something we have to watch closely for with this. So a few things to keep your eye on. Um, neratinib is a drug that's being um, developed. It's a very um, similar compound to lapatinib. Uh, lapatinib has reversible binding to the HER2 receptor, um, whereas the neratinib has irreversible. So it has hopefully a little more potency from an efficacy standpoint, but we are seeing more diarrhea. Can you what the oh, sure. So, so whether or not the drug comes in and binds to the receptor and can never disassociate versus it um, comes in and could possibly disassociate over time. So this is, is back to sort of the the stoichiometrics of the, the receptor and the drug binding. And then afatinib is another drug that inhibits HER1 and HER2. It's also being developed in other cancer types. Um, MM302 doesn't even have a name yet, but this is a compound being developed by Merrimack, and we're actually opening this study at UNC in the setting of anthracycline-naive HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. And yes, ma'am? And that includes epirubicin. And the reason for that is in their earlier phase studies, they didn't see that women who had had an anthracycline actually responded. So they didn't want to offer a therapy that may be, you know, may not help at all. Uh, but I think it's still a point of discussion, and they're still trying to sort this out. Uh, but what this drug is, is has anyone heard of the drug Doxel? Um, it's, a, it's basically adromycin, which is encapsulated in a liposome, stays in the system for a very long time. Um, and this drug actually um, is doxyl, essentially, or a compound very similar to doxyl, but it targets directly the HER2 cells, similar to a TDM, TDM1 approach. So only the HER2 positive cells, extracellular. It is IV. It's IV. So we'll be opening that um, at UNC hopefully in the, the next coming months. These are all extracellular. Actually, the first two are intra, intracellular. Mm -hmm. And this one's going to be extracellular. I should have. You guys are listening. You're learning well. Yeah. That, the the neratinib, the afatinib do, and the lapatinib does. 
Exactly. And there is some data showing that potentially um, pertuzumab and TDM1 are having effect in the brain, even though they're big, bulky monoclonal antibodies. But there have been some, um, some hints that, that we are seeing responses in the brains. You know, I think um, it needs to be studied in a formal manner at this point, and I think those studies are in the planning phases. Yes, exactly. So Doxel has a much less cardiac, uh, much lower cardiac toxicity profile than standard anthracycline or um, doxorubicin. And there's been safety data for that, actually. MD Anderson has published on dual anthracycline with trastuzumab and very little cardiac signal. Exactly. I don't think we standard we aren't standardly doing it, but it has been done and has been shown to be efficacious and interesting. So just in conclusion, and then we'll we'll take some more um, questions, and um, and I'm happy to hear what the group has to say. I think, in general, I think um, we are making significant progress here. I think over the past 10 years, we've seen an explosion of therapeutics, and they're only continuing. I do think we need to still understand that intracellular cascade and how we can be partnering with other therapies to try to get around these escape um, escape pathways. Um, we're seeing new drugs, we're seeing new sequences, we're seeing new combinations, and I think that's evident by some of the clinical trial designs that we're seeing. It's certainly not a one, um, sort of a, a one target, one drug approach anymore. Um, and then again, you know, as, as we've sort of talked about, our goal here is to extend, not only extend survival, but be, have that be um, a good quality survival. So I'm, I'm hopeful that my co-investigators have included quality of life parameters in their clinical trial designs. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. If a person who had, let's say, a tertiary and has uh, left in, say, uh, liver and some other things, okay? Okay. If, if you did a biopsy of each of two different sites, would you expect to find the same molecular makeup as part A? And part B, if you mentioned that clones can exist within the same uh, tumor, mm -hmm. then would it be smart? I think, wow, you are like writing grants for me here, Shirley. So, um, so honestly, one of my graduate students in the laboratory, her whole, you know, kind of thesis project is to look at the differences between metastasis in the same patient. Um, so she's, she's working really hard to do that. Her co-mentor is Chuck Peru, so, you know, she really couldn't have a better um, leader in terms of sequencing of tumors. So I think that is, is I, I don't know the answers to all of those great questions, but I think we're in the process of looking at that. Um, you know, it's interesting, even in my early stage patients, um, they may have two tumors in the same breast or bilateral breast cancer, and sometimes they look the same and sometimes they look completely different. So I, I bet there is a different profile between a lung metastasis and a liver metastasis and possibly between separate liver metastasis. Um, and I think, you know, when we do biopsies, and many of you guys know this much better than me, is that, you know, there are, there are usually multiple passes into a tumor, sometimes four cores, sometimes six cores. I think the problem is we're only doing receptor status on one core. Oh, really? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they usually take one of the cores from the tumor. So hopefully in the future, and potentially, we could look at different parts of the same tumor not only from a genomic standpoint, but from a receptor standpoint. So, so I think why do these patients to request that they do receptor analysis on more than one core? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and absolutely. Yes. Well, there's that, um, right, how many letter word? I don't know. <laughs> more than four. Exactly. Okay. If you've written down questions, I can come around and pick it And then also, too, this is just a group of many of the faces you'll see today throughout the course of the day. Many of our co-speakers, um, Lisa Carey in the top corner, um, leads our, our uh, division and is also speaking today. And I think you'll really enjoy her plenary session. Um, and then multi of the other, multiple others who are either in the clinic with me or in the laboratory. So how are we doing on time? 11. Okay. What's, how long do we have for this session? Oh, great. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. I went over. Yeah. Okay. 
Wonderful. Okay, so these are some great questions. Um, so the first question is actually something I was talking to our fellow about this week in clinic. So why do you think such a high percentage of in situ cancers are HER2 positive, but a relatively no, a low percentage of metastatic disease is HER2 positive? So this is really interesting. We were actually just um, looking at the percentages of ductal carcinoma in situ that is HER2 positive. And in the literature, it's really anywhere from like 30 to 70 percent. But what happens on those early cancer cells that haven't yet broken through a basement membrane to spread to the rest of the body or within the breast, um, they are very commonly HER2 positive. So I think it has to do with what is happening during the evolution of the cancer cells from becoming confined within a space to becoming more um, proliferative and able to invade. So over time, some of those in situ cancers will maintain their HER2 positivity. We know about, about 30%. And then um, some of them will lose it. I think it's just what drives the biology of the cancer cell. But we do see this, dis this discordance between the in situ cancers and the metastatic, metastatic cancers. Um, does that help answer whomever's question? OK. And then the next one is, I have a PI3 kinase mutation. Please speak to how tumor profiling can help or hurt. Um, or, or how could it add to treatment of HER2 positive disease? So um, this is a great question. And at UNC, we have a program called UNSeq. Um, basically, it is a, um, a research uh, platform that sequences 200 mutations in breast cancer. And it's really a matter of giving you know, your physician permission to go back to get one of your tumors. It's not a new biopsy, but to go back to the, the surgical pathology archives and and try to um, acquire this tissue to then sequence. And um, I think with the PI3 kinase mutation in hand, that would logically move someone toward a PI3 kinase um, targeted agent along with HER2-directed therapy. So um, my colleague Claire Dees, who's beside Lisa Carey here, runs our phase one unit and has a series of clinical trials looking at PI3 kinase inhibitors in combination with dual HER2-directed um, HER2 therapies. So one of the arms is capecitabine um, lapatinib PI3 kinase inhibitor. The other arm is capecitabine PI3 kinase inhibitor trastuzumab. So I think incorporating, and that really hits, you know, if we go back to, back to the slide. Oh, there we go. What that will do is it could hit her 2 here with trastuzumab, possibly here, but then also here. So you're hitting multiple levels of the pathway. Um, exactly. I think we're still. It's called UNC. UNC. Exactly. So why isn't tumor profiling standard of care for all biopsies? That's a great question. So I think one is that we don't have a standardized approach yet. So you may go. Oh, sure. So why isn't tumor profiling a standard of care Why is tumor profiling not standard of care for all patients? And I think. Um, I think right now we don't have a unified way to do that, um, like an FDA approved, sort of like Oncotype. You know, Oncotype is, well, it's actually not FDA approved, but it's compendia listed and, um, and sort of accepted universally. We don't have one tumor profiling program. UNC has their tumor profiling program. Wash U may have their tumor, profile, tumor profiling program. There's the Foundation One um, profiling, which does come at a fee. So I think participating in the clinical trials profiling um, usually comes without a cost, um, but Foundation One is also available. Um, so I think, you know, my, um, I'm actually speaking at the FDA NIH on Monday, hmm, Monday, um, about brain metastasis and how we can move therapies in the setting of brain metastasis metastasis into an FDA approved space. We don't have anything FDA approved specifically for brain metastasis. And one of the things that I discuss is like we need to all be coming together. We all need to come together and find a common platform for tissue repository and the sequencing so we're speaking the same language. So, so in order for us to get to the next session, the next slide, we're going to have to We have to stop? Okay. Well, please feel free to find me throughout the, the day. Okay.